Okay, maybe then we can start. I guess now we have more people at least looking at the um, monitor over there. So, okay. very well, our speaker today is uh, Patrick Lopato, member here and newly minted member, and he will talk about spectral statistics of Levy matrices. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to pop into the frame here so you can see me just for a few seconds. And so, uh, my name is Patrick Lopato. I graduated in May uh, from Harvard for the direction of HTL and now a member here. And I'm going to talk to you today about spectral statistics of weather matrices. And this is joint work with Amol Agarwal, Jake Marsnek, and HTF. OK, so now I'll move so you can see the slides. And all right. So I want to ask uh, a basic question. It's going to be familiar to you if you've seen my postdoc talk. And that is, uh, how are the eigenvectors of a random matrix distributed? So to ask this question, I should tell you what I mean by random matrix. Okay. So let's start with sort of the most basic possible random matrix. It's the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Okay, so this is an n by n matrix where we essentially uh, make a, a random symmetric matrix by making the upper of grand entries Gaussian, and then we flip them over the diagonal and we adjust the variances on the diagonal a little bit. And the reason we do this is to make the distribution of this matrix W invariant under orthogonal transformation. So we can ask now, what is the distribution of the eigenvectors of this uh, GOV ensemble? And we can note that by this rotational symmetry, its normalized eigenvectors are uniformly distributed on the unit sphere. OK. And then using these facts, we can say, OK, well, let's take a normalized eigenvector. And we know that the uh, eigenvectors are uniformly distributed on the sphere. And so we can use a basic fact that is a simple calculation that you could give, say, to a first year graduate probability course, and that fact is that the first coordinate of the uniform measure on the sphere is asymptotically Gaussian after you rescale by root m. Okay, so this is a, sort of a very explicit uh, calculation using, the Gaussian, using um, the Gaussian density, and so you can just deduce pretty quickly that the rescale eigenvector coordinates are asymptotically Gaussian. Okay, so for this question, uh, what is the distribution of the eigenvector entries they have a very nice, uh, elegant answer, and that is they are asymptotically Gaussian. And so we can start asking now more, uh, you know, sophisticated questions, which is, well, you know, you know, the, for for the Gaussian uh, matrix, what it is. What about we stick in now other entry distributions, say, you know, Bernoulli, or say centered Poisson, or something like this? Well, uh, it was proved fairly recently by Borgard and Yao that for any symmetric random matrix with finite variance that you will also have uh, Gaussian entry distributions. And now the question I want to talk about today is, uh, what happens for matrices when the entry distributions do not have a variance, okay, the infinite variance, and maybe even infinite mean? What happens? And so that is going to be the main topic for today. So uh, I want to define first the model I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to consider symmetric power law distributions with power law tails and the parameter I'm going to talk about is always going to be the power law uh, alpha. Okay? And so we're going to consider alpha between 0 and 2. And for this range of alpha, these distributions have infinite variance. And when alpha is less than 1, they have infinite mean. And this model was introduced in a paper of uh, Rousseau and Zizou in 1994. And it was, they were motivated by applications in physics to certain spin glass models, uh, in finance to this. Um, but it's observation that financial data, uh, well, people often use models that you know involve, say, Brownian motion or Gaussian distribution, light field distributions. That in fact, in realistic financial data, we see these sort of market shocks and crashes that are very, very poorly modeled by these light field distributions. You can think, for instance, of the various shocks that occurred earlier this year due to the pandemic. You know, these were much much larger than we would be predicted by a Gaussian distribution. And uh, more recently, there's been some work. Uh, that has found uh, some applications uh, for these matrices in neural networks. Okay, so uh, precisely uh, these are called Levy matrices, and uh, the model I'm going to talk about today is going to be considering a particular class of power law random variables called Levy distributions, and these have a uh, these are called so these are entries that are alpha stable laws given by this characteristic function where C is some constant, we can write that explicitly. 
And we consider uh, these distributions because of this nice uh, form chemist function, which permits some exact, exact computations. But everything I'm going to say will hold true uh, for sort of similar uh, symmetric power law distributions. Any sort of reasonable power law distribution with an alpha heavy tail that is symmetric, what I'm going to say will be true. Okay, so in a sense, all the, all the results I'll talk about are going to be universal. And, okay, so we take our matrix, and again, we make the upper triangular elements the alpha stable laws. And now we're going to rescale by a different scaling, uh, n to the negative 1 over alpha. Okay, and we choose this scaling so that the spectrum is well behaved when n goes to infinity, and I'll make that precise over the next few slides. Okay, but essentially, this is the scaling that gives you the correct asymptotic behavior. So what do these matrices look like intuitively? Well, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe we will see it later, but here it, it seems like the the alpha equal one is somehow with the same scaling with, with the Gaussian scaling. Ah, uh, so in the in the Gaussian it's scaling by uh, one over root n. Oh, but, right. yeah. So okay. the, the, the variance the variance is one over n. So the alpha equal two is the yeah when alpha when alpha goes. To two and greater, we get the regular. We, yeah, yeah. We, so you, should, we should get into the yeah, yeah. Uh, Gaussian greater. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what do these matrices look like? I mean, how can you think of these intuitively? So, these distributions are, are heavy tails. They have sort of in each row you see some outliers. Okay. And with the scaling, the outliers are going to give you, on average, a constant number of elements of order one. And then the rest will be sort of very small that come from sort of typical realizations of these random variables. And so after rescaling by n to the negative 1 over alpha, these are going to be size n to the negative 1 over alpha. So if you want to think of this, this is just a, a sort of a sparse matrix, a very sparse matrix, plus some random noise added in. OK. The outlier just means it has, it has to take very large values. Right? Yeah, it takes very large values. Okay. And so in fact, this is sort of halfway between um, you know, a usual dense matrix and actually a sparse matrix. And so many of the things I'm going to say are today are also suspected to hold true in some form for sparse matrices without this noise. OK, so, uh, so here's a here about these eigenvectors, these matrices. And so if we consider uh, the median uh, eigenvalue, we consider the eigenvector corresponding to the median eigenvalue, then instead of a Gaussian limit, the rescale eigenvector entries correspond to a Gaussian with a random scaling. And this random scaling, we can write down it very explicitly. Okay, we can, write, we can say it's 1 over square root of s, where s is an independent positive random variable with this Laplace transfer point. Okay. So already, we see that something essentially different is happening. Okay. That but when you cross over into the infinite variance regime, you have a much different phenomenology. Okay. Well, now, this is for just the median eigenvalue, or it holds for a range of eigenvalues around there. So let me let me explain the next slide. This okay. is just for the median the median eigenvalue. Okay. So for this, we can write it down very explicitly. Uh -huh. But in general, what you get is near zero for very whoops, for very small eigenvalues near zero. You get this one parameter family of non Gaussian distributions, and what the non Gaussian distributions are are they are a uh, a Gaussian times some other random variable. Okay. And that random variable depends sort of on the energy where the location of the eigenvalue. So it's a deformation of what you're saying. What yeah, you it's a deformation of what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. And it just so happens that at zero, <laughs> at zero we can compute it explicitly and we get the formula on the, the slide previously, but away from zero we don't know exactly what the distribution is. Okay. And so uh, already this is very interesting to me. And then um, so there are a few other things that are true. We also proved that for these small eigenvalues, there are correlations between nearby eigenvectors. And I didn't mention this before, but this is completely unlike the GOE eigenvectors. For the GOE, everything is just independent, independent Gaussians. So again, we see some sort of novel behavior happening. And uh, something really interesting, which will be sort of maybe the subject of the rest of this talk, is that uh, when alpha is less than 1, um, it's not always like this, that when you consider eigenvectors that are associated with large eigenvalues, you see something completely different. Okay. 
And so I want to make this a little more precise as, uh, as we go on. And this was proved, um, this is suspected by physicists, and it was proved by Bordnab and DNA when alpha is less than two thirds in 2013. Okay. Can yeah. you go back one, one slide back? You're yeah. talking about. This is distribution of the single uh, element of a single entry of the of an of yes. the eigenvector. So I take an eigenvector. I take say, the first element. But do you, do you have some kind of correlation? So would you expect them to be equally distributed in some way, or or is it? Yeah. So within within a single eigenvector, yeah. you do not see correlation, but between eigenvectors, you see correlation. Okay. And again, that's not what happens for a, a GOE. The GOE, everything is just independent. Okay, so it's and, again something. And new. the correlation are all for the same entry. Yeah. So different different eigenvalue, different eigenvector, and different entries. I don't I don't think so. I think it's just the same. It's it's, it's the, the same. same. Yeah. It's so, the same. So it's like we have we have yeah uh, correlation on the rows. Yeah, I think that's what we think about it. Certainly, certainly within one eigenvector, though, it's independent. So thanks for the question, yes. Uh, OK, so the rest of this talk is going to be uh, saying a bit more about this and then how we prove that here. OK, so uh, I want to go now, before heading back to the eigenvectors, I want to say just about the eigenvalues. OK, and so we asked you know, sort of a parallel question, which is how are the eigenvalues distributed? And so this normalization ensures that we have a nice uh, limit for the global spectral distribution when n goes to infinity. So we get a picture like this. Okay, so in the limit, um, the spectrum becomes this sort of heavy tail distribution like this. Okay, and I, I sort of have truncated this at negative 15 and 15, but actually when n is very large, you see things that are all the way over here, all the way over here. Okay, the truncation just to make a nice picture. So um, before I, I state these sort of more refined predictions, I want to state two basic notions. So the first is um, a that is a delocalization. So we say that going in back, so going back, go back, yeah, go back one slide. What is that distribution? Yeah. Do you know a formula it's, for it? No, it's given. It's uh, by a fixed point of a complicated equation. Uh, and you know, it's not compact support. What do you know? It's not compactly supported. It has a density. It's symmetric. It's and it has alpha heavy tails. It so has alpha heavy tails. Yeah, alpha heavy tails. And it's supported every. It's it's yes. not compactly supported, but it's got full the full line of support. Yes, and in fact, it has power law tails. Okay. Yeah, with the same power law as the entries. Then it depends on alpha only. Yes, depends on alpha. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, yeah, and so I wanna I wanna just state two basic notions, and the first is that of delocalization. So we say that an eigenvector is delocalized. Essentially, uh, if its mass is sort of equally distributed amongst coordinates, you can think of the case if it has L2 norm one and all of the coordinates have equal mass, they must all have mass uh, one over root m. And so we can allow a small n to the epsilon fudge factor. And if that is true, we say the eigenvector is completely delocalized. And sort of the opposite, okay, yeah. and this is um, what happens for the GOE and for finite. For finite variance, random matrices, all their vector, all their eigenvectors are delocalized. It corresponds again to the eigenvector mass being sort of spread out. But the epsilon depends on n. Yeah. So, you, so more formally, you pick an epsilon, and this is true for large enough n depending on epsilon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I guess I didn't write the opposite concept. The opposite concept of that is is uh, localization, where the eigenvector mass is concentrated on just a few entries. And then for the eigenvalues, we say if the local eigen uh, local eigenvalue statistics, um, so local eigenvalue statistics are statistics of a finite number of eigenvalues, and sort of the canonical one is when you take uh, the gaps and you rescale them. So for the GOE, uh, the correct rescaling is n, and if you do this in the limit, you get this sort of distribution, and this corresponds to the fact that the, the eigenvalues of the GOE are, are highly correlated. And they appear to sort of repel each other. So you can see from this graph that it's very unlikely that you find two eigenvalues that are very, very close to each other. Okay. So they sort of act like charged particles, sort of pushing away from each other. And the opposite concept here is uncorrelated eigenvalues, and these are said to display Poisson statistics. Okay, so it's just a Poisson sort of Poisson point process where you throw independent eigenvalues in a line or something. 
Okay, so with these two notions, I can state some predictions uh, from the physics literature, and these are from a paper of Tarkini, Rolli, and Tarzia in 2016, and I emphasize that these are non-rigorous predictions uh, through uh, a very nice argument based on uh, replica symmetry breaking and supersymmetry, which is very convincing, but again, not rigorous. Okay, and so these are predictions, and sort of the main question is, to what extent can we rigorize these predictions? Okay, so when alpha is between one and two, we predict these GOE eigenvalue statistics everywhere and complete uh, eigenvector delocalization everywhere at all energies. Okay, so there's just one phase, it is delocalized. When alpha is between zero and one, something interesting happens. We predict a phase transition. So there is a mobility edge, E alpha, which depends on alpha, and if your eigenvalue is less in absolute value than E alpha, you will see uh, these GOE local statistics and delocalization. But if your eigenvalue is greater than E alpha, you will see Poisson local statistics, that is, uncorrelated eigenvalues, and complete eigenvector localization, that is, the mass is concentrated on just a few coordinates. And there's even, they even give us uh, an explicit formula for E alpha, which I will show you in just a few slides. And I should note that there are some earlier predictions of, uh, from this original paper of Cezo and Michaud, uh, which were slightly different. For instance, they predicted a mixed phase when alpha is between uh, one and two. Okay. So between one and two, you have uh, uh, you have delocalization everywhere? Yes, or? there's one phase, it's delocalized. And so only when you have infinite mean do you see this phase transition. How would they come up with these regulations? Uh, so there is a computation uh, based on Green's functions and a Green's functions of expansion that they then map to a problem of random polymers. And they solve the random polymer problem by replica symmetry breaking heuristic, which as far as I know, um, we do not have to make rigorous. And so that the proof of the, of the theorem I meant to display uh, proceeds along sort of entirely different lines than, than what they sketch. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here are the predictions in sort of graphical form. So along this axis, we have alpha. It goes from 1 to 2. And along this axis, we have the energy E. And so this thick line is the mobility edge E alpha. And so you can see over here in the GOE, or sorry, in the regime when alpha is greater than one, or when alpha is between zero and one, and you're at small energies, that is small eigenvalues, you have these GOE statistics and you have a delocalized uh, eigenvectors. Whereas if uh, the energy is large and alpha is less than one, now you see Poisson eigenvalue statistics and you see localized eigenvectors. And so I said that there is this formula for mobility edge, and I have displayed it here. I don't think it is so helpful, but I, I display it just to say that there is something sort of, um, you know, fairly specific going on with the heuristics they use. Okay, um, and so they can give us this explicit equation in terms of all these things. Um, so here, C and beta are parameters that are determined. Uh, you can determine explicitly the self consistent equation. Uh, here you have a probability distribution that is a general alpha stable law with skewness parameter beta and scale parameter c. And it turns out that this equation for the mobility edge has a solution only for alpha between 0 and 1, which matches the predictions I told you on the previous slide. And uh, they can even say that it should diverge as alpha goes to 1, like 1 over alpha inverse. Okay. So there is this very interesting prediction. Um, I have no idea how to prove it, though. So, uh, with... Uh, I assume they check it numerically in Monte Carlo. Eh? Yeah, they did. And it's they correct? Did. It is correct. Uh, there's an issue which... Uh, so, actually, we're going to see on this slide. I said the original paper of Boucheau and Tezot, uh, they detect they, they predicted this sort of mixed phase, right? This sort of mixed phase between uh, one and two. And it turns out we were actually, uh, to preview, I mean, I'll, I'll say more about this. 
we could we could rigorously establish that that phase does not exist and was just sort of an artifact of numerics. Okay, and so in fact the numerics here are kind of tricky because you have these very heavy tail distributions and things converge in weird ways. Right. So the numerics are not always trustworthy, but in their case they did match the predictions very well. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, with a mole and Professor Yao, uh, we were able to prove uh, the following things. And so first, uh, we could establish this delocalized phase between one and two completely. So all eigenvectors of uh, one matrix are completely delocalized and uh, local are asymptotically, and as again asymptotically, all local statistics are GOE. So that completely resolves the prediction for alpha between one and two. Now, for almost all alpha between zero and two, uh, we were able to, uh, actually, I should say one thing. One thing which I deleted is that this uh, works for energies that are not exactly zero. And so that will get covered by this result down here. But, but I, can, I can go far out in, in tails, right? This, this, this distribution has tails, right? Yeah. But even in the tails, I'll see this, right? I'll see this uh, delocalized structure. Yeah, as long as you fix energy then what, and go to infinity. Yeah. So I can imagine that if you, I think it's true that if you, if you consider like the largest one every time, you see some different behavior. I think yeah, that's yeah. true. So if I fix, fix the energy, then with enter into infinity. Yeah, then I'll energy. still see the GOV, and I'll see this yeah. delocalization. Right. OK. And then when alpha is between 0 and 2, uh, we could prove that there is uh, this regime at small energies, uh, again, of delocalization and GOE statistics. And so uh, here we get just this sort of like, non-explicit neighborhood around zero. Okay, and so likely this neighborhood does not extend to the conjecture mobility edge. So if we put a graphic on the on the, on the screen here, that here we have it all. Here we have a non-explicit uh, neighborhood of zero, which likely does not extend to this mobility edge that was conjectured by the physicists. And I should say that this drawing, I drew this as a straight line, just to make it look nice, um, because it's not explicit. You know, this can sort of wave around. You know, we don't know. But you proved the localization in that whole area, and and the, and the GOE too, or yes, delocalization and GOE. So uh, going back to this, we have complete delocalization and GOE statistics. The thing that you didn't highlight was almost all which you did in your short talk, and I uh, was yes kind of perplexed. Then and I'm just as perplexed now. All right. So to I think to I think really say something intelligent about that, I need to say more about the proof. And so I have some slides at the very end where I say that about that. To give me a, to give me a taste, you put in conditions on alpha. Yeah. Which don't remove all alphas and leave you with almost all alphas. But is it yes. like a countable set that you're removing, or you just it's really okay. a a measure a set that you know is a, a zero measure. I can tell you, I can give you the very brief sketch, which is that uh, the, the limiting measure is given through a fixed point equation. And you want to study this fixed point equation. Okay. And uh, for various reasons, it's hard to study. And so a previous, we actually rely on previous work at Bornoff and DNA. It just comes in this previous work at Bornoff and DNA. And what they do is they study a map uh, they want to know that a certain operator is an isomorphism, and so they study a map of like alpha. They study basically. They end up what they end up doing is studying an analytic function of alpha, and so they can prove first of all that the analytic function of alpha is not constant, and then they can prove so that means that it can only have uh, you countable, know, countable, 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 countable any zeros, right? And they can't accumulate, and so you know that this thing can't can only fail to be an isomorphism, you know, count the number of alpha. So it's better than almost all. Yeah, it's better than almost all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you've answered my question. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, almost actually, all sounds like a very strange. It's all but a countable set of all alpha. All but a countable uh, set. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very happy. Okay. And I can I can say more about this at the end. I have some slides on that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. So returning to this, so thank you for the question. Uh, and returning to this, okay. So again, 
uh, this is the picture. We have delocalization when out is greater than one, and we have a delocalized regime, which may be much sort of, uh, you know, more ugly and jagged than this nice picture suggests between zero and one. Okay. So they could touch. It could touch Z. I mean, for it could. Bizarre, it could. You know, we don't know anything. Yeah, for all we know, it could touch it. We don't know. And so having, I think, stated all these results, I want to say a bit about uh, some early results and some motivation and then a bit about the proof. So there was some earlier work done on this problem by Bornoff and DNA, as I alluded to earlier. And they were able to prove uh, sort of partial delocalization results, but they were not able to achieve the optimal exponent uh, 1 over 2. So they have this, and it varies with alpha, but even at best, it's only 1 over 4. And then, uh, again, I mentioned that they could prove localization of large energies for alpha less than 2 thirds and say explicitly um, how many coordinates the mass is concentrated on roughly uh, in a certain precise sense. And then, in a second paper, they proved, uh, again, partial delocalization results at small energies. Okay. So uh, the virtues of our work are that we obtain the optimal delocalization exponent and we obtain GOE statistics, which were not mentioned at all in these papers. So one main motivation for this work is to understand Anderson-type transitions between localization and delocalization. So just to review a bit of the Anderson model, we have discrete Laplacian plus uh, lambda, uh, some constant, times a diagonal potential. And so uh, when uh, lambda is uh, small and dimension is large, we expect this to be analogous to a Levy model where you have uh, regions of localization and delocalization. There's been a lot of work on uh, localization at speckle edges. Uh, and recently, um, so some very classic work by uh, people in this room and also some recent work on uh, Bernoulli disorder. So um, the point here is that in the fine volume limit, uh, it's we're able to prove, well, not we, but people in the, you know, people with this problem are able to prove that there are Poisson statistics uh, in the localized regime. And we expect that there's a sharp Anderson transition from GOE to Poisson, but currently there are no reverse results on the existence of GOE statistics for random turner operators. And so one thing I like with this problem is that we're able to establish uh, in a model that is expected to exhibit an Anderson-type transition the existence of GOE statistics. So a finite volume limit means that you're considering a, the problem on a grid and then take yeah, yeah. on a periodic, uh, yeah, yeah. On a periodic grid and take just and the Yeah, when I go to infinity. Uh, this is just an analogy rather than a direct connection. I mean, yeah, there's no rigorous connection. Okay. But, but again, as far as I, I mean, uh, I don't think it's, there are very many models, maybe you can correct me, where it's known that we have GOE statistics in the localized regime with an Anderson transition, without it's expected. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but these physicists who made this model had this as just an analogy, or they, they they didn't have any further connection. They just raised the random matrix problem by itself. Yes, that's correct. Right. Yeah, but uh, because of probably its connections with stained glass and and, uh, and and that kind of thing too, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. There was some also. Yeah, with spin glasses yeah. with parallel reactions too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, there, there, there were recent works on. Such models where you insert some kind of uh, periodic uh, random potential, uh, some some kind of a periodic driven uh, a periodic driven Anderson model where you can see all kind of uh, new no, new uh, localization properties. Uh, where you, then you have a system of two parameters, the lambda and another parameter, uh -huh. and you have a, a very similar phase diagram. I'm not familiar with this now, I'm sorry. Okay. And something else is uh, I want to go back and contrast the behavior of this model with the behavior of essentially all the other finite variance models that we study in random matrix theory. So 
uh, Eugene Wigner had this sort of vision that random matrix statistics were in some way a universal, uh, and universal models were sort of uh, at least a subset of correlated systems. And this was proven for uh, Wigner matrices, so these matrices with independent uh, elements on the upper diagonal, uh, above diagonal, and then flipped over. Uh, and the and so also uh, for sparse random graphs, adjacent matrices of sparse random graphs, uh, for adjacent matrices of the regular random graphs, and even for uh, band matrices with large bandwidth. So these are uh, matrices where I look at the diagonal and I zero out all elements that are a certain distance from the diagonal, and that distance is called the bandwidth. And so you can imagine that um, in the limiting, one limiting case, I'm looking at just a random diagonal matrix, and so I just have uh, completely localized eigenvectors and independent eigenvalues. And in the other limiting case, I have the full random matrix, the full Wigner matrix, and so I have delocalization and GOE eigenvalues. And somewhere along the way, there should be a transition, and that transition should actually be at uh, bandwidth square root of n. And so uh, we have not been able, or excuse me, uh, these mathematicians have not been able to uh, reach that critical threshold yet, but there's been a lot of work on this, sort of bringing the region of delocalization uh, to smaller and smaller bandwidths. Uh, and so that's why I say for large bandwidth, we see these GUI statistics in delocalization. And so the moral is that you know, all hang these on, models. Hang on. The, the, yeah. uh, maybe I'm not up to date. I thought they could not do deregular graphs. I always had to assume that it was slightly more. Ah, so, okay, uh, the question is, what is D, right? The question is, can they do D constant? They can't do D fixed, they, yeah. Yeah, they can't do D, as far as, they, they, yeah. yeah. Okay. My understanding, maybe I might have data also, is that they cannot, is that there is not yet published work that does D constant. Uh, well, you're giving me a hint here that maybe they're claiming it, all right. Okay. Well, and I, I would also mention in the case of band matrices, there's this work of Shabrina, Shabrina, which gives you a, right. which gives you a sharp, which gives you the sharp, what does this predict? And, is, is it has more conditions on it, but it's stronger than that. Yeah, so I should say certainly for certain band like models, there is work of uh, both the Shabinas, uh, and they can do, as you said, down to the, the critical threshold. Right, right to the critical. Okay, so for all these models that I, I just described, uh, these all have in the bulk geostatistics, field plus eigenvectors, and a compact spectral distribution. And so one thing I like about these Lie matrices is that certainly for alpha, especially for alpha less than one, we see a behavior that's sort of completely different than the models in the literature, okay? So for these, these finite variance models, we have a spectrum, and this is for a Wigner matrix, so you have a spectrum like this that's compactly supported, and um, again, delocalized eigenvectors, uh, whereas for these Lie matrices, we see something that's you know, essentially new, that's, that's totally novel. Okay, so uh, that's the motivation for this. And now I should say a bit about the proof. And so I want to introduce uh, sort of the basic technical tool we use to investigate random matrices, and that is the surface transform. So the surface transform is this integral of a measure. And the way I like to think, so there's another way to write this, which is as the trace of the resolvent. Okay, and so you end up with this nice formula here. And the way I like to think about this is sort of as, as smoothing out the spectrum. So if you look at the imaginary part of the Stiltus transform, what you get is uh, like a convolution of the spectrum with an approximate delta function on scale theta. So this allows you to sort of consider a sort of smoothed out version of the spectrum, which gives you something you can sort of analytically work with. And the idea is that the smaller and smaller you can take eta, the better and better your estimates will be. And uh, one thing I should say, and maybe an intuition, at least in the, in the Wigner case, is you have n eigenvalues crammed into a constant width interval. And so you expect the spacings to be about 1 over n. And so in fact, this is true that the eigenvalues fluctuate on scales 1 over n. And so you cannot really control, I mean, if you want a sort of deterministic statement in the limit, you can't control windows of size uh, 1 over n, 
but you can want to you kind of want to control in windows of size that are just a little bit bigger, asymptotically than, than scale one around. So you get some sort of averaging effect, and you can say something deterministic. Okay, so there was a method uh, developed by uh, Dirdush, Yao, and their many collaborators, uh, which I won't even try to name all of them, uh, called the three-step strategy for proving universality for Wigner matrices, proving these GOE statistics. And so I think maybe the best way to explain how the proof goes is to say, you know, how does the proof go in the finite variance case? Then, then what are the obstacles in adapting it to the uh, infinite variance case? OK, so there are three steps here. And the first is to look at the Stiltz transform, the sort of smoothed out uh, spectral measure, and to look at windows um, of order just greater, by n to the epsilon, just greater than 1 over n. And what step one will do is we'll give you some sort of a priori control, which is useful for the latter two steps, and it will also provide delocalization. And so once you have these sort of preliminary estimates, what you can do is you can show that if I add a small Gaussian perturbation, added a Gaussian perturbation to my matrix, uh, then the Wigner matrix is GOE. And then finally, uh, there's a density argument. So you sort, of, you sort of can imagine that these matrices, if T is very small, say as we're going to zero, you can imagine that these matrices will be sort of dense in the space of all matrices. And so then uh, you say that, well, these matrices are all you know, GOE statistics, and they're dense. And so in fact, this should be true of any Wigner matrix. Okay. So that's a very high-level overview, again, of the case of the finite variance case. And so I want to say a bit more about the finite variance case than I want to say, uh, you know, where this sort of needs to be modified and what the problems are and sort of pushing this through the infinite variance case. OK, so there's one thing we can handle reasonably quickly, and that is this question of delocalization. So I said on the previous slide that the Stolpus transform is the trace of uh, the resultant matrix. And so in fact, when you do step one, what you actually gain is you gain some control on not just the trace, but even the diagonal elements themselves. And so suppose, you know, if you grant me this, if I have control over the diagonal resultant elements with high probability over these windows that are just greater than the eigenvalue fluctuations, then a very simple computation gives you localization. So you by the spectral theorem, you can write down this. And then you just set um, <laughs> z to be the, eigen, the corresponding um, eigenvalue for the eigenvector you care about. And you can just compute, essentially, by the spectral theorem that you get what you want. Okay. So delocalization is something you get sort of for free once you have these preliminary estimates. And so now we can focus sort of exclusively on the, um, the eigenvalue questions. OK, so as I said, sort of the key step here, you know, once you have these preliminary estimates, what you want to do is, is study these additive Gaussian perturbations. OK, so where I take the, the matrix, and then to each entry I add um, Gaussians, and I do it in a way such that the matrix remains symmetric. OK. So sort of an amazing thing, which was discovered by Dyson, is that when I do this, the eigenvalues uh, the evolution of the eigenvalues are governed by a very simple system of stochastic differential equations. Okay, and the system is called Dyson Brownian motion, and I have it written here. And so this is kind of amazing because you don't see the influence here of the eigenvectors. It's all in terms of the eigenvalues, so it makes it much easier to analyze. Uh, and the way I think of this is sort of as the particle is executing non-intersecting random walks. So if you want to make sense of this, one way you can Think about it is first to ignore the second term. Okay, so if you go to the second term, what is the same? Well, it's saying that each each eigenvalue is sort of undergoing you know a Brownian motion random walk. Okay, and then what is the second term saying? Well, it's saying that when the eigenvalues get very close together, this is going to blow up and sort of drive them apart. Okay, so the way you think about this is you say, well, the particles are executing this sort of uh, non-intersecting random walk. And this coheres with the picture we saw before of the GOE statistics, where you know these eigenvalues are almost acting like sort of charged particles, because we're unlikely to see them um, be very close together. Okay. And so again, this goes back to Dyson. And so once you once you make this observation and you're you're trying to prove short time 
sort of uh, that this reaches equilibrium in a short time. So the equilibrium measure for this is just the GOE. And so what you want to show is that if I run this for a very short time t, that I'll start to see this equilibrium measure, this, this, GOE, uh, this GOE measure, these GOE gap statistics. And so now the work in this step is just entirely an ST uh, problem, and in fact becomes a PD problem. And so we can just forget about the matrix model and study this SD. Okay. And this was done. There were a few works before so this. This, this uh, PD is a, is a parabolic. Yeah, parabolic. Uh, but with many, many variables, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, part of the reason you want this preliminary, these preliminary estimates essentially to be able to replace the eigenvalues by their deterministic locations. So you, want, you, so you kind of want to get the randomness to go away at some point. But yeah. So the point of the point of obtaining the sort of the step one estimates is to make the analysis of this of this SDE much easier. Okay, so there were a few works on this, and uh, sort of you know sort of the ultimate one is this work of uh, Landon and Yao, where they consider Dyson Brownian motion with deterministic initial data, and so basically what they can prove is that if I can control the Stokes transform, if I can control the initial density down to some scale eta, if I can then run the Dyson Brownian motion for a little bit greater than eta. So if I run it for basically time that is greater than the amount of regularity I have, that is sufficient to regularize uh, the eigenvalues and give these GOE gap statistics. Now, how general is this? I mean, do I need to have, does my age need to be, uh, would this work for, for random Schrodinger or what? So as long as, for any deterministic initial data, any, any, that's smooth enough. Oh, but it's just the data is yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but your, your age has to be, it has to have a mean deal structure. That's my question. Uh, so, so I'm not sure what you mean when you ask. No, I'll, I'll, I'll ask okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. But yeah, just consider it purely as an SD problem. Yeah, yeah. You give some smooth initial, smooth enough initial data, and if I run it for sort of greater than you know a time corresponding to how smooth it is, yeah. then I, I get GOE statistics. Okay. So what this says I is Johansson, I think Johansson had a version, crude version of that before, which is quite general. Yes. So I don't know much about this. There's work at Johansson. Um, that relied on explicit formulas in yeah. the in the permission case. Uh, I think he needed he couldn't get down to the scale you went here. Yeah, so he could go down. I think to like just end the negative c for small c for permission random matrices based on um, the exact formulas that are available in that case. But sort of the virtue of this is that you can do um, you know real complex quaternionic. And in fact, any sort of what are called beta ensembles that generalize these random matrix models. Okay, so uh, I said before that the time to equilibrium is essentially the regularity you have at the beginning. And I said that we can control the eigenvalues down to scale almost one of n. And that means after time a little greater than one of n, we're going to have. Uh, these GOE local statistics. And it was also observed that the global statistics observed in about, uh, well, sorry, the global statistics converge in about constant time. And this goes back to Dyson. So Dyson essentially, uh, he, he predicted both of these things. And this is quite easy to show, but this is actually sort of quite hard to show. And this is sort of the main technical input, this short time equilibrium that makes the entire uh, a lot of the entire, oh, sorry, a lot of the recent breakthroughs in random matrix theory work. Okay, it's sort of the fundamental technical thing. If you, you know, you know, this DBM reaches equilibrium after a short time. And so this proof is through um, modernization and coupling the diffusion terms. And so they're able to reduce the analysis to a discrete parabolic equation. And then essentially just, uh, you know, they, I think you know, the benefit of this is that now they have, they have a PD. And so they can take off, you know, take off this diffusion term and they analyze this PDE. And this is a quite long technical paper, but again, very powerful because it gets it, it gets the result for arbitrarily, essentially arbitrary deterministic initial data. 
And recently, I also want to point out there is this very elegant proof proving the matrices to the maximum principle of uh, Michael God. And this page is like a 20 page paper. It's, it's really great. But I guess, uh, to, in, in view of what you're going to say, I expect they don't actually prove GOE. They just show it's the same as if you were the Gaussian, yes. somebody yes. else computes that for you. And in your situation, you might also be proving that there's one answer, but then somebody still has to compute something for you. Yes, exactly. That is correct. So they, they couple it and they show it's the same as the Gaussian ensemble after a short time. And then they rely on other people for, to compute the Gaussian ensemble. And, and that was computed. The literature, I always point this out because the first person to compute that is actually Gordon. Yeah. It's usually attributed to other people, but it's called down. It's like uh, the Gaudin meta distribution. Who, who, sorry, who are you? Who yeah, are you thinking? G A U D I N. The yes. ma mathematical physicist was the first. Vignem had a surmise, which was wrong. Yes. Meta yes. then, uh, Meta and Gordon were uh, students of the same guy, I think, and they shared an office, and that was that collaboration. But Gordon was the first to realize how to use orthogonal polynomials in this context. So I usually call it the Gaudan meta distribution. No, that's fine. As long as I you say, say Gaudin, okay. Okay. I'm happy. All right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, there's so, a, just historically, there's a reason why, if you go to any real physicist in the laboratory, they don't even know. There's, there's something called the uh, ansatz, the uh, Wigner ansatz, and it's uh, for any practical application is good enough. So they don't even know there's a real answer to the question. <laughs> is, is this the Wigner surmise or is something no, different? Yeah, Wigner surmise is yeah, a, okay. within 1% of the answer you would get for these locals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, well, thank you. So, uh, okay. So, and then the density, so that was step two. And then I'll say a bit about the density argument on this, on this slide. But now I want to say, okay, you know, we have this, this three-step strategy that is based around nice and Brownian motion. Uh, what breaks when we try to apply it to this infinite variance case? Okay, why, why is this a hard problem, right? And so there are a few things. The first is that step three, this sort of comparison density step, uses something called the four-moment matching strategy, which is due to Tao and Vu, and later refined by Erdo Xiaonian. And this is sort of analogous to uh, Vandenberg's proof of the central limit theorem, basically it says that if I have two random matrices and uh, the first four moments of their entries match, then they have the same local statistics. Okay. And so this is used sort of very crucially in the proof of universality of winner matrices, but here it breaks down, right? Because we don't have four moments to match when we have, uh, you know, sometimes one moment, sometimes no moments. Okay. So this is, so for the first problem is we need to find a substitute for that comparison step. The second problem is we don't know how to establish a local law on the optimal scale, uh, which is just a little above the fluctuations of order one over n. So I, I uh, this work of Bornheim DNA, uh, they derive some local laws, but they are not at the scale. In fact, much above the scale, they also deteriorate as alpha tends to zero. But, but you get that scale eventually uh, in, your, in your range or not. So we get a scale that is better than the scale in the previous literature and good enough for our argument. Uh, we also write in the introduction of this paper that if you want to, it is likely you could use, you could go down further, but you don't, you don't we, don't, we don't actually need to. Okay, okay. We, don't, we don't write explicitly. Okay. Okay, and the third thing which is interesting is that these resolvent entries are now random in the limit. So for random matrices, these concentrate uh, and become uh, constant around its trace, the semicircular, semicircular law. For here, uh, in the limited case, they are just a random variable. So these are sort of the three things that prevent just running this uh, machinery of, of Erdoshiao, Schlein, um, and many others. OK, so what is the main idea of the proof? The main idea of the proof is this sort of small, large composition, which I will not explain. So take a Levy matrix and fix some parameter less than one over alpha. What we're going to do is we're going to split the matrix H into two matrices, A and B. 
So B stands for big, it will be the large entries, and A is gonna be the small entries, okay? And by doing this, again, this connects back sort of the, the picture I, I said before about this being a sort of sparse matrix with noise. We're going to think about, um, this is not quite the decomposition, but we're gonna think about um, sort of B as being sort of the backbone of, of big, you know, big entries, and A as being a sort of small, uh, you know, sort of noise matrix. And what we're going to say is that, well, A is going to look enough like a GOE to provide the regularization that we need, to provide sort of Gaussian perturbation. And so formally what we say is that we are going to try to approximate um, A by root TW, where W is a GOE matrix with the right variance. And so we're going to argue that, in fact, uh, H, for the purposes of these local statistics, looks like B plus root TW, and then we're going to do the moment comparison after conditioning on the entries B, that all of the moments are finite, and then we know by the result of Lin, so and Yao, that this is uh, GUE, which means the original one must also have GUE statistics too. Now, by looking at the large matrix elements, that the, what you call the B, did, they, did you say that looks like a sparse matrix? Yeah, so it depends. It looks like a sparse matrix. It, the sparsity depends on where you take the cutoff, right? Yeah. So for, for yeah. here, for here, it's it's dense enough that we can make all this work. Okay. Yeah, not not super sparse. Yeah, it's not super sparse, right? It's it's super sparse. You cut off at that sort of constant yeah. order. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the new strategy is to first derive a local wall for B, then to show that local statistics of B plus the Gaussian perturbation are GOE, and then to show that we can replace the Gaussian perturbation by the matrix A and get back the original A matrix. So there are a few problems with this that we have to sort of solve in this very lengthy paper, and that is first, it's, it's hard to estimate uh, the error when T is large, right? So there's a sort of trade-off where, um, you know, I said the better and better regularity you get on the initial data, the smaller you can take t, but um, it's it's hard it's hard to get that, and so you need it. In fact, for large t, it's harder to do the comparison, and so you want small t. But getting small t requires better estimates, and so you need to have some sort of trade off between you know what estimates can you reasonably get and what estimates allow you to actually perform the comparison. Okay, and there's sort of this big uh, big problem of you know, previously, when you do this perturbation, the W is dependent. Here, we're trying to think of A as, as sort of a perturbation, but here now A and B are highly correlated. And so this correlation has to be addressed in proof. And then a final issue is that the entries of B are not alpha stable, and so some modifications in previous literature um, are needed to derive a local law. Okay. So, that this is in a nutshell how the proof goes for the eigen the, the result about uh, geo local statistics and complete localization. And I want to say just a bit about the theorem I showed originally about these non Gaussian eigenvector uh, entries. So this uses a sort of modified three step strategy. And again, so again, it's you know, first you derive some uh, preliminary estimates, then you study short term equilibrium, and you compare back. So in the short time equilibrium step, you have convergence of the entries to the diagonal means function element uh, divided by the, this should be imaginary part and still just transform. I guess it's easy to put the imaginary, uh, imaginary parts and then times a Gaussian. So when you have a Wigner matrix, as I said before, these concentrate. So this just cancels and is one. Here, these don't concentrate, and, and this sort of, uh, the fact that you have a limit, that this limit is not random variable in distribution is what gives this random scaling here. Okay. So at a very high level, that's what's happening, is that the, the fluctuations in the eigenvectors are coming from the fluctuations in the limit of the resolvent entries. What, what can we say about the, this limiting distribution? The, the I'm glad you asked. I will say a bit about this just uh, right here. Okay. So uh, 
maybe the final question is, well, what's responsible for this non-concentration of the resolvent entries? So if I were to sketch the proof to you of, uh, you know, what is the limit of resolvent entries for a Wigner matrix now? How does this proof go? Well, there is this formula from linear algebra called the Schrankelmann formula. And I can apply it to the first row and column to get this sort of uh, fixed point equation for a diagonal means function element. So if I stick this in, I get this. And uh, it turns out that I can ignore the off diagonal terms here. And so this is just a, a sum of diagonal terms. And then sort of just by a sort of concentration law or tempers type result, this in the limit, because these are all sort of order one over n, and there are n of them, this ends up being, and these are all identically distributed, this ends up being uh, this fixed point equation for uh, G11. And in fact, this is the defining equation for the surface transform of the semi circle law. Okay, so this is sort of like in one page how you prove uh, semi circle law for the matrices, how you prove concentration of the, of the resolvent entries. So now, what goes wrong here? What goes wrong here is that you no longer have this sort of law of large numbers here. And so what happens is uh, this sum does not concentrate, and instead you get what's called a recursive distributional equation, except so for, uh, for the limiting random variable r star. So r star in distribution is 1 over negative z minus the sum of these IED copies of r times this Poisson point process with a certain weight. And so now you have a much more complicated uh, characterization of what the limit of the resolvent is. And I should say, the reason we're able to get this result for the median eigenvector is that when z is 0, this can be solved explicitly. And we get the random variable we saw a few slides ago. But when z um, is not 0, mm -hmm. We don't know how to solve this. You know, we know there's some random variable that solves it. We know existence, uh, but we don't know, you know, how to write it explicitly. Okay, and so I think that is a good stopping point. And uh, just to summarize, so we have these heavy type matrices that conjecturally display an Anderson type transition, and we were able to establish a complete delocalized phase uh, for all alpha between zero and two, and we found new non-Gaussian eigenvector statistics. So again, thank you for inviting me. Questions? Yeah. If, so if the uh, if if the entries in the initial entries are uh, have some kind of small correlation, then this would get into the proof where, where you do the a plus b. Where how can you treat? How can okay, so your question, your question is if I have um, entries that are so instead of being independent, they're correlated now. Yeah, right. some kind of very small, small correlation, something. To okay, so I can tell you it's known in the finite variance case that if you have, say, exponentially decaying correlations, this will not affect any of the limits. Okay, so if you have very small correlations that decay rapidly, it won't affect anything, basically. But every, everything stays the same. Uh, for this heavy tail case, I don't know. And you know, if you ask me to speculate, I would say if the correlations are weak enough, it probably won't change anything, but I would not be prepared to prove that rigorously. Are you familiar with um, some work of Bogomolny, probably the same time as the other physicist you were talking about? I remember him showing me, uh, but I thought he was looking at the, there's another universality, that is if you take the Gaussian ensemble, not where you make the entries, not the Wigner ensemble, but where you actually make it orthogonally invariant, and then uh -huh. e to the minus trace of a potential, mm -hmm. v of x, yeah. v of m. Right. Uh, so if you put e to the minus x trace, uh, trace x squared, that's the ga then the, then the thing's Gaussian, but otherwise right. it isn't. And the universality is still GOE or still go down uh, local spacing statistics as proved by. Dave said, though. Yeah. So that universality is sort of basis free, physically, usually more fundamental. Right. And the, the universality there is that it doesn't matter how you cut off with V, but I think if you put a tail there, so it doesn't go down that fast, then you get something different. Is there, is, is there work 
for that uh, heavy tale. He showed me <clears throat> some, uh, when Bogomolny does something, he, he gets the right answer, that I'm sure of. He does, it's not a rigorous proof, but it's the right answer. So uh, uh, maybe- you know, I'm, not, I'm not aware now. I would be very- It might've been for random polynomials. I'll, I'll look it up and send it to you, but he definitely right. was looking at heavy tails with new distributions that he was very excited about. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I'd be uh, interested to talk more about that, actually. Yeah, I'll send that to you, I'll find it. Okay, thank you. So your weight would be, uh, Peter, your weight would be G, uh, would be uh, invariant under a yeah, weight orthogonal. So it would be E. Uh, orthogonal, group, but, but you have tails in the. In the yeah, yeah, it doesn't get very fast, so that. Uh, it's usually, but first it does it in the company, they have very fast decay. Yeah. Right, they need analyticity, in fact, and right, uh, right. all other kinds of things. So, yeah, so, okay, I see you, I see you. I'm just asking if that also has the feature that uh, maybe you would get new distributions. All I, I vaguely remember him telling me, look at these interesting new distributions that come out of tails, which yeah. is exactly the, this lecture, <laughs> except that Bogomolny wouldn't have proved anything. That's all. He would have yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. derived it from some uh, some kind of analysis, but I, it might have been this, it might have been a precursor to the two physicists who you mentioned. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'll have a look. Great, thank you. I'll certainly send you and Tom an email. Yeah. But this is very interesting. So the one thing you don't know is what the answer is for any alpha, but which is not Gaussian, which is not GOE. You don't you don't have explicit answers. In in what case? What for what question? Alpha is between zero and one. Yeah. You only know for outside a countable set that these uh, that the spacing distribution. Do you know the existence of the spacing distribution always or only for small yeah. energies? Only. For small energy, you can do it for the whole range, basically. Yeah, for small energy. No, yeah, I'm not worried. Okay, I'm just uh, in the region that you can deal with. Yeah, yeah. And the answer there is not explicit. So I just back to my old question that if. Uh, well, it's the uh, GOE statistics, yeah. right? If it's not it's GOE, the GOE, then you don't know what it is. You just know its existence. No, it you, is have, GOE. you have the local statistics, you just don't. Yeah. It's GOE statistics. Yeah. Uh, oh, where you do prove it, it's GOE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's rescaled, you know, rescaled by the density, but it's GOE. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the line that, that, that separates it. It's yeah, transition it's, it's line. the transition line. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sorry, what you're finding is a <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. So uh, below the line, conjecturally, you GOE and above you Poisson. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So there's no, yeah. there's no mystery answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So did they make any, are there any, I don't. Maybe it's not a well-posed question either. Sure. So is there? There's supposed to be an edge, which they kind of they yeah, yeah. which they say they know where it is. Yeah. Question is, do they know what happens at that edge? In other words, for example, localization length, or you know, whatever, whatever that would mean. So I think they. I think. I I believe uh, that what happens there is what should happen at an Anderson. Transition, particularly some multi-factor. Anderson transition, this behavior will change with dimension. Okay. And this is a kind of a mean field model. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So so yeah, it would be. Yeah. yeah. If you understand what I'm saying, so yeah, yeah. it's not. It's not clear. Okay. Not clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If. There are no more questions. Thank you.